to grow relationships, Father God, as, as, as we leave here and we go out into the world, I just ask for your hand on us that we continue to show Jesus Christ to the world around us. And we show him brighter and brighter each and every day. And Father God, I just thank you. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do in this time, in this message, Lord. It's not my message, and I don't want it to be my message. It can't be my message. My message would be jacked up just like me. And so, Father God, it's got to be your message. So please, Spirit, lead me, guide me, deliver this message. Use me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. He's on the move. He's on the move. This morning, we're kicking off a new series, a new series. I told you last week that this new series is going to be called That's Weird, okay? And so y'all probably went home and started thinking about what weird stories are there in the Bible, right? Because I did share, I think I did share, sometimes I think I said it and I didn't really say it. I think I shared. Um, yeah, my wife's back there, yep, he does. <laughs> and so, um, but, but so I believe I shared that we're going to talk about some weird events from the scriptures, right? And so we're going to look at those and how they relate to our lives. And today, so, so throughout the week, you probably were like, oh, what stories are you going to share this week? What stories? Are you going to? And if you drove by, you saw the billboard, the, the signage out here, you probably said, oh, the floating axe. Okay, good. I got that one. So, um, right. But maybe you had some other ones went through your head and you're like, hey, how about this one? How about that one? How about the other one? Guess what? We'll probably talk about some of those. Okay. So this series is not one week or yeah, it's not one week. It's five weeks. So, so we're going to talk about a few different things. And so um, as, as Stephanie talked about, uh, Grayson knew. My, my grandson knew, right, um, going into sixth grade. Did I get it right? That's what I meant. He just finished sixth grade, okay? And so, uh, man, I can't keep, they change it every year. I don't get it, man. I stayed in 12th grade for like six years. I just was like, it's a good time. So just kidding, I didn't. I didn't one shot. But, but anyway, um, uh, but they keep changing it every year, and so I can't keep up. But anyway, he, she, she expectantly catch that in her heart, right, was that she was really expecting that they didn't know what the floating axe was all about. <laughs> and some of you were like, floating axe, what's that? <laughs> and we're going to talk about that because <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> okay, so, but it's God weird, and so that's good. So today we're going to kick off this series with that, with a, with a story about that, but I'm going to talk to you, I want to talk to you, see, the floating axe has to do with Elisha, the prophet Elisha. Now the problem is that many of us, we think Elisha and Elijah are the same person or, or we mix up the stories back and forth, right? And so we continue to mess those up a bit, and, and so I just, you know, Elijah was, was he's probably, if, if you've been in the church, in the scriptures, um, for any length of time at all, you probably, you've heard of Elijah, or as they say, so oftentimes they would say like the prophet or whatever, right? And they're talking about Elijah oftentimes, and, and so he's an Old Testament prophet, okay? So we're going to give you a little background here. He's an Old Testament prophet, um, and he did some really cool things. There was some, there was some stuff that he, he did, I'm like, yeah. And so, so in case you're confused, we're going to go through a couple of them. Uh, there was a famine, and during that famine, there was a widow that he, he approached a widow, um, and, and, her, and her son, he asked her for food, and she said, all I have is enough to make a meal for my son and I, and then we're going to wait, and let, we're going to wait until we die. And Elijah says, hey, guess what? God says, if you'll share that meal for two with three, uh, he will not allow your food to run out before the drought is over, before the famine is ended. And so, uh, and, and you know what? She did. She, she had faith, and she, she fed him. And guess what? Her food held out, and she did not run out, right? And God is good for his word. He keeps his promises. He's a promise maker and a promise keeper, right? And so, so, uh, uh, so she did that. Then there was uh, later, her, her son dies, Later, her son dies, and she comes. She she calls out to Elijah, and she's like, "Dude!" And he says, "All right, we got it." And Elijah brings the boy. God through Elijah brings the boy back to life, and that's quite the. When you read that story, it's like, "Whoa!" But it's cool, right? And so it's a cool story. Um, uh, probably my favorite though is when when Elijah challenges the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal. Okay, so he probably he he, he goes up, he goes toe to toe with four hundred and fifty of Baal's prophets. We all know Baal, right? Well, maybe we don't know Baal. I shouldn't assume. Um, Baal is that that pagan god, right? And and so all these people they keep turning from God of Israel and going to Baal or some of the other the other uh, false gods that they had to carve out and put in a corner somewhere, right? And so because they're so powerful. And so anyway, he's got four hundred fifty prophets of Baal that he challenges. He says, "All right, here's the thing, right? So we're gonna do we're gonna do we're gonna build a a a, a, a 
altar, will you, you build your altar to Baal, I'll build mine to the God of Israel, right? Um, we're, we're, we, I'll give you choice of the two bulls. You choose which one you want. You sacrifice yours over there. I'll sacrifice mine over here. When we get it prepared, though, we don't get to light the match. We've got to pray to our God. Whichever, one, whichever God lights the fire, whichever God lights the sacrifice, that's the God, okay? And so, uh, uh, so these 450 prophets are over here. They chop up their bull. They put him on the, ma- on the altar, all that stuff, right? Got their sticks in there and whatnot, and, and they, they, they're, they're there, and they start praying, bail, 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 and then bail didn't bail them out. He just didn't, right? I'm just saying, right? Uh, he, he, they're, they're ba- they're all, day, all morning, there's a boom, 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 and so pretty soon, eventually, um, Elijah says, uh, hey, guys, guess what? Maybe Baal's busy. Maybe you should cry out louder because he can't hear you, right? And he mocks him, right? And he says, oh, by the way, maybe Baal's asleep, and he can't, he's snoring too loud, he can't hear you, so maybe shout a little louder right and they, they and they just get louder and louder. Pretty, pretty soon it's like okay it's elijah's turn because this hasn't happened over here right and so elijah elijah he goes all right so he sets out he preps his right? he builds an altar with 12 stones interesting because 12 tribes right we know 12 god's a god of numbers elijah uses 12 stones representing the 12 tribes i think that was a little uh to the baal prophets because there was 12 tribes, but at this point, the tribes have already split because the 10 northern tribes have already broken off and call it, kept the name Israel. The two southern tribes have become uh, joined together as Judah. And so, so it's a little to the, there's supposed to be 12 of y'all, but you ain't, you, you ain't united anymore, right? And so he, bring, he builds this altar out of 12 stones and, and, and he gets his, his cow up on, or his bull up on it. <laughs> farmer's going to get after me if I call it a cow and so gets his bull up on the altar right prepares the whole thing he even digs a trench around it to put seed in he puts about 240 pounds of, of seed in the, in this in this trench around the altar and then he, he steps back he's like hmm and Elijah just goes you know I kind of feel like Michael Jordan take in my prime uh taking on a fifth grader in basketball right? He says, how about we even the odds a little bit? Here's the thing. Uh, Take those four big jars of of water over here. Let's pour them all over this sacrifice before I call my God to burn it up. And so they take the four jars. Remember that Jesus, when he turned water into wine, right? They They were the big old vats of jars, right? They were big jars of water to wine, right? These are the kind of jars that he has four of those dumped upon his sacrifice that needs to burn. And so, and they're still like, you know what, let's do four more. Let's fill them up again. Let's do it again. And then he says, guess what, let's do it a third time. They literally dumped 12 of those big old jars. It says that there was so much water that it filled the trench even. So now the grain's even wet. He's not, the grain's not going to start on fire, right, because it's wet. Elijah calls on the Lord. The Lord says, boom, there it is. And he burned her up. He burned everything up. It even says he burnt up the water. He burned up the altar, and he burnt up the sacrifice. All three, amen, praise God. That's pretty cool. Amen? Elijah, I like Elijah. Now, there's a little something, something else that goes on with that afterwards with them 450 prophets. You check it out, okay? Uh, so it's, it's in, uh, um, you can go to 1 Kings 18, uh, um, it, verses 20 through 40 is where that particular one's at. Um, but uh, anyway, so, so uh, Elijah, he's, 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 there's one other thing that I want to share with you. I mean, there's a ton of other things, could, but one other thing is Elijah never died. He did not die. Yeah, he did not die. Um, so he did not die, right? And so um, he, he, he didn't die. Uh, Enoch was the first one who didn't die, who was taken to the Lord without dying, and now, now Elijah. Um, and so that's a, that's, have you ever heard the song, uh, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot? See, that Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Those, those, some of the words from that, because I don't remember verses very well. Um, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Swing low, sweet, uh, uh, coming to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. I saw a band of angels coming after me, coming to carry me home. That song is about Elijah being carried home by the chariot of fire and the horse of fire. It's based off of this scripture from 2 Kings 2, verse 9, where it says, when they, when they had crossed, they crossed the Jordan. Um, by the way, uh, 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 Elijah had taken his cloak, and he parted the waters of the Jordan with his cloak. Okay, God parted the waters of the Jordan by Elijah's using his cloak to part the water. So they were able to walk across the Jordan on dry ground. Him and Elisha walked across on stri- dry ground, right? So it says, when they crossed, when they crossed the Jordan, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. Sound very prophetic, sound very much like Jesus, right? 
um, when he's talking with his disciples, like, I'm going to be leaving soon, right? And so, so he says, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Now, Elijah was, he was, he was the, the goat of prophets, okay? At this point, he's the goat. He's the greatest of all time of prophets at this point. I don't like using, I shouldn't use the word goat when I'm talking about God's people because they're sheep, devils are goats. But anyway, so, um, but anyway, so, and he's saying, hey, here's the thing, man, you've been amazing, but I want to be twice as amazing. But here's the thing. Elisha's not asking for twice as amazing to make Elisha look good. He just wants to be able to do twice the work for God. That's what it's about. And we get that confused. We're like, oh, he's kind of proud, prideful and arrogant. No, that's not what it is. It's, he wants to be able to do twice as much for the kingdom is what he wants to do. He just wants to, he wants to just keep going and build faster, bigger. And so, um, so anyway, so you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. That's cool. That's cool. Elijah doesn't have to suffer death. He don't have to put up with this world anymore, and Elisha gets to see this firsthand. He's there, whoa, and he just got his prayer answered. He just got his request answered because now he'll have a double portion of what Elijah had when it comes to being a prophet. For the God of Israel, that is. Baal, well, you know. But uh, so anyway, so, so some of you might say that's kind of weird. It is kind of weird, but it's the way God works sometimes, right? And so um, have you ever read along, you've been reading along your scripture, and all of a sudden you're reading along, and, and some of you haven't read the story about the, the floating axe, right? axe head, right? So, you, so the, today's story is weird to you, right? Um, but you're reading along, and you're like, whoa. That's weird, right? You ever had that happen to you, or is it just me? Because uh, if you haven't, and you've read your scriptures much at all, that's weird, okay? I'm just saying, because there's some weird stuff that was on in our scriptures, right? And so as we, as we walk into this series, series um, uh, we're going we're to talk about that. So I've talked about Elijah because I don't want us to, 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 to confuse Elijah and Elisha, and I'm hoping that today we'll separate some of that out for you as we talk about a few things Elisha did. And, and you'll see as we walk through this, you'll see why people get confused oftentimes with Elijah and Elisha. Which one did that? Because sometimes they both did that. Sometimes they both did that. So even though Elijah gets the most press, time, right, the most coverage, uh, Elisha, he was no shirk. He was, he was pretty big time himself, right? And so, so Elisha, he, he uh, after Elijah, uh, psst, yay, <laughs> the, angels, uh, the angels rejoice, right? And, and Eli, Elijah goes to heaven in the chariot of, of fire, um, and, and with the horse of fire, now I'm like, uh, have you ever seen uh, um, um, Hunger Games, right? Girl on fire of one, <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. This didn't take special effects, okay? This is just God doing God, right? And so, man, the chariot on fire, horses of, uh, of fire, and away they go, right? And so, so after this, now Elisha, is, he's like, whoa, and he's, he's distraught, and he even tears, uh, uh, Elijah's cloak is there, and he, he says he tears his cloak in two, right? So guess what? That means you better have your body in the best shape you want it in when you die, because guess what? <laughs> Some of your clothes are hanging out back here, okay? I'm just saying, you're not going there with clothing, all right? So, uh, so that's a side note. Anyway, so he picks up the cloak, right? Right. He rent. He tears it in two, and then he does what? He goes. He goes. If we know the story, he goes and crosses the Jordan back to Jericho on dry ground, and he uses Elijah's cloak as his tool to do it. God does it through through Elijah's cloak once again. So a little similarity there, right? And so he does that. That's uh, uh, in Second Kings. Um, to, um, uh, verse 19 through 22, the leaders of Jericho now have heard that Elisha's there, and they've heard he's this prophet, and he was, he was Elijah's student, and they're like, he's supposed to be kind of a big guy, right? And they go to him and say, hey, our town's Jericho's water source is, is bad. It's not good for cons human consumption. It's not good for crops. And so Elijah go Elisha goes out. See, I'll, I'm going to mess you up. Elisha goes out, sprinkles some salt in it, calls upon God. It's healed, and the water's good for him to drink and to use for their crops. Boom, done, hello, right? And guess what? Even cooler than that, though, is even today, 3,000 years later, that water still is 
is good for drinking and good for the crops, okay? God does what God does. That's cool. Amen? So then we go on, and, and, and um, because, you know, you just can't have enough weird stories. Um, this one's kind of a weird, peculiar one, but it's not our main one, but, but it's one that I think is interesting um, because it shows us a little bit of, of I think, a little humanness in along, uh, amongst the prophetess, the prophet of us. And, and so if you continue on, verses 23 through 25, um, Elisha's returning uh, to, to Bethel from Jericho, and, and there's these boys, a, gr- a large group of boys, not a, bar- not a group of large boys, but a large group of boys, uh, jump out or come up to him and start mocking him and making fun of him, and they're like, hey, Baldy, go away. Hey, Baldy, why don't you go home? The, the, the scripture says, hey, Baldy. I didn't think that was a term back then, but apparently it is. And so... Um, the weird part's this, right? Because we think a prophet, well, the prophet's got it going on. He's in control, right? But Elisha, says, he, Elisha curses those boys, and two bears come out of, come out of the, the wilderness. The two bears come and maul 42 of these boys. Now, I think that's a little extreme, but I don't know. Maybe he was having a bad hair day. <laughs> and so, uh, so thank you. Um, dad jokes come. Uh, they're, they're natural. So, but, but, but they were mocking him, right? So, so that's, it, that's a weird story. It's like, why would he do that, right? But I think, I think a little human comes in there, but I also think that we've got to watch who we're mocking. Hello? Right? We're mocking some people. I, I think we've got to watch who we're mocking. For one, we shouldn't be mocking anyone, right? Because we're supposed to build everyone up, lift them up, right? Um, so we really shouldn't be mocking them to start with. But if you're going to mock someone, might not want to do it with God's number one, okay? I'm just saying, you know, his number one dude on earth, you know, um, uh, probably not want to go to mock him. In fact, I would, I would advise you not to mock any of his people, right? And so, um, but anyway, so uh, like I say, that's a little strange, uh, a little weird uh, on that one, but uh, even if it is excessive. Um, the, other, the, la- the, the, the next one is, is Naaman. Uh, Elisha is the one who healed Naaman from leprosy. See, and oftentimes people think that's Elijah, but that was Elisha who, who healed Naaman from leprosy. Naaman was, remember, the, the, the elevated soldier. He was the big guy, right? And so um, and a, uh, a Jewish girl told him, hey, you need to talk to Elisha, and he'll heal you of your leprosy. And Elisha does heal him of, of his leprosy. Okay, so, um, but, uh, uh, so, and Elisha also performs uh, 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 miracles with oil. Um, he also, for a widow, and, and he also raises a son from the dead, and, he, and when you read the two stories of his, his uh, bringing the, the, the son back from the dead and Elijah bringing the son back from the dead, when you read those two stories side by side, it's like, whoa, was it the same dude doing it? Because the technique, every, I mean, what he did, what they did, what the Bible describes, it's like, wow, that is very, so there's Elijah and Elisha both equal, they, 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 they should be like, maybe he would be opening act, I guess, for Elijah, I don't know. But they're, they're man, a living. They, they, they were powerful prophets for the Lord. And so, uh, so some, of that is, some of that's weird, but here's, here's our story for today. Um, so our story for today is, is Elisha's gathered, he's, he's, he's been training up new prophets as well, right? He's, he's, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ in our world today, New Testament, Okay, um, uh, you will. If we're going to do what Jesus did, then we need to to share the good news. We need to train up new disciples, and as we get trained up, we need to go and make disciples, make more disciples. Right? That's what we're supposed to do. So, in the Old Testament, the prophet still needed to raise up other prophets. He still needed to raise up, train up other leaders, and the Levites needed to train up other leaders, right? Uh, uh, other religious leaders, and so, so he's 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 raising up the next generation. Is what he's doing, right? So he's training them up, and then the number grew so that their their current facility wasn't big enough for him anymore. And so they they were going to do you might call it a campaign, a capital campaign, right? A construction campaign, right? And so they go down to the Jordan and start chopping down some trees. Okay, so they go down and start chopping down some trees, and as they're chopping trees, well, dude's a little like swinging the axe, swinging the axe, and bing, it's just stick, and he's like, what? And his head's gone. Right? The head flew off of his axe, and it landed in Jordan River. 
okay? And so that's where we're at. That's, that's the one we're talking about today. Now, that might not be strange or weird or anything like that yet, but guess what? It's coming, okay? Um, so um, 2 Kings 6, verse 5, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. So, so we're going to just start with the axe head part of it uh, before we finish up 5. Um, but, but, but So my first thought is this, right? If I lose the axe head, now mind you, I don't know if you all have swung an axe very much in your life or not, but if you have used one often, um, especially if your dad doesn't like have extras laying around and all that stuff, right? Um, you might lose an axe head. I know I did a couple different times as a kid, right? Be swinging, 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 and whack, it's just a stick, and it's like, that didn't work. And so, uh, or you go to pull it back, and the head's stuck in, this, in the wood, right? Um, so, so that's happened, right? So my first thought on that is, let's go down to Canton Home and Farm or go to Baumgars, pay 30 bucks, 40 bucks, get a whole new axe, right? I'm not worried about just the axe head necessarily, right? If, if you lose it in the water, right? But that's not the option that they had here. See, because I want to, and, and some of us might be like, why would, why would they even put this in here? But guess what? Losing an axe head apparently was not like an oddity necessarily in that day um, because in Deuteronomy it talks about it in Deuteronomy 19 verse 4 and 5 it's talking about they, they'd set up these kind of sanctuary cities and it says in there it says this is the rule concerning anyone who kills a person and flees for their safety anyone who kills a neighbor unintentionally without malice a forethought in other words didn't think ahead on didn't plan it not premeditated murder right um, for instance a man may go into catch this a man may go into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood and as he swings his axe to fell a tree the head may fly off and hit his neighbor and kill him interesting that man may flee to one of these cities and save his life it's saying man it was an accident you shouldn't get killed but in that day eye for eye hello right and so he could flee to one of these sanctuary cities so Deuteronomy speaks of this long before Elisha's walking Right, and so so it's interesting when you initially you're like, well, what's the that's just got it. that's just really a fluke. Apparently, not necessarily, a fluke, but God uses it uh, to for this weird story we're going to talk about. Um, I got it got me to thinking when I found out Deuteronomy was spoke to it. I'm like, wait a minute, and and so I'm like, okay, so now. How is it these axe heads are just like randomly just flying off? Didn't they have the little wedge to put in there, tighten it up? Didn't they, what? You know, no epoxy back then? What? You know, right? But here, take a look at these pictures, okay? So I Googled pictures of 3,000-year-old axes. So, oh, shoot, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Can we do them? Yeah, there. So, so the, I, I was thinking side by side, but sometimes I don't say what I thought I said. And so I didn't say. Um, so uh, so these, are, these, are, these are what they call axe heads. Doesn't look like what we have today, right? So, so if we go back to the other one, please. Notice how the stick goes into the axe head. See the lashing right there? You see that little eye? It's got that lashing. That's a leather, leather lashing that's on there. And so it's just held on by a string of leather, right? And when you think about that, and if you look at all those other ones in that other pile that we have, I uh, see all those, the, all them little eyelets. That's all over the place. Even that one up there, that's broken uh, at the do- top up there. It's got a, an eyelet on the back end of it. So they're all st- attached with, or most of them were attached with, uh, leather lashing. When we think about that, think about that. That that was a tough material. They didn't have, they didn't have like. Uh, uh, um, uh, fire line or spider wire or nothing like that good fishing line to hold them on with right and so they had they, that, that's what they had they didn't have steel co- uh, uh, braided steel right back in the day they didn't have anything like that that was that tough so this but what happens when you're using it well it wears out and it tears it breaks right and so now it's when you see that you're like well now i guess i could see how it is that those those heads go flying. You should be checking them, right? Because Dad always said, check the oil in the car and check the lashing on the axe, right? Before you use them. And so, but here's the thing, right? So so this could be a deal where, where maybe that's why it seems to be common and that's why it was in Deuteronomy. So, um, but anyway, so it, it's, it's not as weird then when, when, we, when we realize what that, what that look, how it was held on, right? Because... My, the axes I used, the head, the handle, right, is always bigger at the top than it is below. And then you got the wedges that you put in, the metal wedges you pound down in there. And if it gets loose, guess what? You pound another metal wedge in there until you can't pound more in. And so, uh, or you break the handle. But uh, so anyway, so now we can understand, okay, now that's how that could fly off, right? So anyway, um, we've all lost stuff though, right? We've all lost stuff, not just axe heads. Um, we've all lost stuff. You, you've lost your keys at some point, right? I still have, my wife will tell you, when I broke my leg that day, I had a ring of keys. <laughs> I have no idea where they're at. 
I had to break a lot of locks, drill some locks. I was like, I have no idea. I can't find them. I think they went in the garbage with my pants when they cut them off of me at the hospital, I think is what happened. But, but it was what it, we lose things. I, uh, maybe, I don't know about you, have you ever lost your, 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 your glasses? If you do, look on top of your head because that's usually where they're at. Okay. Um, you ever done this? Done this, right? Yeah, if I could get my flashlight out, and if I could just find my phone, I know it's here somewhere, right? We've done it. Have you ever lost your car in the parking lot? I have. (laughs) There's some rotten people out there because I hit my button that one day to get the horn to honk, and someone was watching because I had a honk, honk. I'm like, who's the rotten animal, right? (laughs) I've literally gotten into the wrong car. We all lose stuff, right? Some stuff is okay to lose. Some stuff we kind of need it back, right? My wife's going to be upset if I don't bring her Jeep back from, from the grocery store, right? So I need to bring it back. But, but anyway, so we, we lose things. And, and Ozzy Osbourne is, is credited with it most of the time when you see the quote. Um, but but uh, Mark Twain is also, is also quoted with, with it. It, it. It goes like this. It says, out of all the things I have lost, I miss my mind the most. Right? I don't know which one of them actually is. Should be credited with it. I could see where that happened with at least one of them. And I could see where it happened with me, okay? Because I lose, it seems like I lose a little bit of my mind. It seems like every, like every week I'm like, oh, man, where'd that go, right? And so, right, and so we lose things. Um, some of us, we lose some things that, are in, in all seriousness, we lose some things. We lose some years because we didn't invest them well, and we've lost them. We, 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 sometimes we lose a relationship because we didn't love very well. Sometimes we lose these things that are of importance to us because we didn't take care of them very well. Maybe we lose our peace, our calm, because we've lost our trust and our faith. So we lose some things we definitely need to get back. The keys, I can drill a lot of locks. I can buy new doorknobs. You know what? You can even change the ignition in your car. Some things, though, we need to get back. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the axe, back to the axe. If we go back to verse 5 there, Second uh, Kings 6, verse 5. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. Oh, no, my Lord, it was borrowed. Here's the thing, right? Some things, they get lost, and if I lose my keys, that's on me, and it's mine. It's, well, I'll deal with it. If I borrowed your car and I lose your keys, that's a whole other story because now there's that, oh, and it wasn't even mine to lose. You ever done that where you borrowed someone's something or another and then you lost it or you broke it when you're using it? It's like, oh, and you couldn't afford to buy it or didn't want to buy it at least, and that's why you borrowed it to start with. And, and, and so now, now guess what? You get to buy it, and you're still not going to have it, and you're still going to have to borrow it from pastor next time, right? Y'all, we talked about this, right, borrowing? And so, um, but right, so, so um, we, we've all lost something. We've all, all lost something that, that it just like gut wrenches us, doesn't it? And, and that's not even talking about people, uh, not talking about people dying, okay? Um, that's, even, that's just, uh, maybe it's that relationship that we lost, that spouse that we lost, that child that we lost, and, and they're still walking the earth, but we lost them. Those relationships, that relationship with God that we had, we were doing really good. We were walking, we were like rocking and rolling, we were like almost like Elijah and Elisha, right? Because we were doing so good, and all of a sudden now we got something going on which really it's never all of a sudden. It's usually, it's, it's a def- definitely a progress, a procession of things, but it seems like all of a sudden it was gone and now we're not walking with him, right? Some things we need to get back. Some things we definitely need to get back. But the loss of the things that we have, we could, we could, we could deal with that a whole lot better if we could really wrap our minds about, around something that you might have heard of. Uh, you might have heard someone share a message on this somewhere along the line. Everything I own is on loan. Everything we own is on loan. If we can really get that, when we lose, especially the stuff of the, the stupid keys, I'm like, whatever, right? Um, well, gonna, I don't know how to get all them gun locks off, but I'm going to have to, right? So they got drilled, 
right? Because you got to have the guns, right? And so, um, but, but uh, the, the locks for the buildings, right? Um, well, we, we'll get more keys. We'll, we'll change locks. We'll do what we got to, right? That's okay. Stuff like that. that. That stuff's okay. Even if I lost my wallet, lose money, right? You lost money. I've lost money. I have a daughter, two daughters and a wife. And so I've lost money. <laughs> the wallet says, hey, where'd that go? Right? So uh, they found out now I don't carry cash anymore ever so so now they don't come near me when i'm sleeping and try to st- snag the wallet so you know just say uh, i'm just teasing i i had to have that in there for stephanie so um but uh anyway so so we've all lost things right though but we can get by without it maybe it makes things uncomfortable or or a little more difficult or whatever but but it's not life ending life threatening it's not anything like that and it's definitely not eternally th- uh, life ending, right? And, and so if we can get that whole, everything I own is on loan, if we can get that, we'll understand that, look, God gave it to me for a period. And and sometimes when we lose it, he didn't lose that ax head. It went away. It got lost. But it wasn't just necessarily that this, this student, necessarily, it wasn't like he was out there being careless, right? Um, he didn't leave it laying on the on the donkey and send the donkey out to pasture. You know what I'm saying? He didn't do that, right? So, so but what we need to do is is we need to go from the axe to the ask. We need to go from the axe to the ask. Okay, and we're gonna do. We're, this is what we got to do when when we we lose that axe, right? But we're gonna go to the ask of that axe. Okay, and so it's interesting that the man who lost the axe said. Did we notice that he didn't, he, didn't, uh, uh, he didn't ask Elisha to do anything? He didn't ask him anything. What did he say? He said, oh, my Lord. Oh, no, my Lord. It was borrowed. He just told him about it. Look, oh, man, I'm without it now. It, it was borrowed. That's what he tells Elisha, right? We know he, his frustration wouldn't be there. His anxiety wouldn't be there. If it was like just laying on the edge there, he could just step in and go grab it. He could, it wasn't like he could see it. He was going to need some help finding it, right, to, to retrieve it. And it was borrowed. And, and if that 3,000 years ago thing, iron was, uh, that was a commodity. And iron tools was a commodity. And not very few people were able to afford to buy them. You could find them maybe. And if you were really good and had a forge at home, which wasn't like everyone's home didn't have a forge necessarily, right? Uh, plus, you needed the materials in order to forge the iron tool, right? So it wasn't like they were just all over the place. You didn't go to the store and just, they got 30 axes here. Okay, wasn't a thing, right? And so he, his frustration, he, he shows his frustration to Elisha, right? And, but, but he doesn't ask him to do any portion of what Elijah had. He's received it. This is God's man, right? So he knows, he knows that, but... I'd be thinking, you know, there's a problem here. I can't afford another axe head. I don't have one hanging out in the garage, right? Um, if something can be done, this man, this mighty man of God will know what to do, and, and, and he'll cover it, right? He might have been thinking that. I don't know if he was or not. It doesn't tell us that, but he might have been thinking that. But that's where I kind of go is like, he didn't ask. He did not ask him to go, hey, dude, could you float the head there so I can find it? Didn't ask him. I don't think he was just whining. I don't think he was just complaining, right? He, he wasn't doing that, was, but he, there was some concern. There was some de- definite concern in that. And so he turned to the man of God. He turned to the man of God. And it, do, if we remember, in that day, we didn't get to just go to God, right? You had to go through the priest. You had to go through the holy man, through the prophet, you had to go to him to go to God, right? And so that's uh, that. Uh, so he goes to God, the closest, directest route he can, which is through Elisha. So if anyone's going to fix it, he's going to. And so, so he just trusted Elisha. And I think First uh, Peter five verse seven um, um, helps us understand this. And maybe maybe we can get to this place. Where it says, uh, it says in First Peter five seven it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Okay, see, see, the, we're supposed to cast our anxiety, our struggles, our fears, our, our like, oops, I lost the axe head. We're supposed to cast that onto God. That I lost my loved one. We're supposed to cast that onto God. 
because he cares for us and he will care for us. He will, he will if we allow him, right? But we, have to, we need to cast it upon him, not try to hold on to it ourselves, keep that lost thing for ourselves. If we believe in that, right? We, we just need to, all we need to do is just give it to God. And if we could get that, man, our lives would be so much better. If we could, if we could get that, man, I lost something, um, but I'm going to just cast it to God. And that's what he did. He cast it to God through his prophet, Elisha, right? And then we can trust in the fact that God will, God will use it. He will, he will mend it. He'll give the axe head back. Or he'll heal the, fix the handle, or he'll he'll fix the relationship. He'll whatever he'll do, whatever he's going to do that healing the cancer, whatever he's going to do, he's going to do it according to our good and the kingdom's glory, right? And we have to remember that we have to trust in that, we have to believe in that. And if we truly believe that, we'll stop whining and complaining. We'll stop asking the wrong people for assistance with what we need, what, where our loss is at, where our problems at, our anxiety, as the Bible calls it, if we'll just cast our anxieties upon the Lord. And then he'll take care of it. And then trust that God knows what he's doing, okay? Because <laughs> he kind of has an idea, okay? But do we really trust that? Do we really believe that? That's where the struggle's at. That's why we don't cast it on to him. We don't give it away. We, keep, we, we go, here it is, and we keep fighting him for it, right? We have to cast it upon him. However, did you, did you notice he didn't, he didn't tell Elijah, uh, Elisha what he should do about the, broken, or the lost axe head either, did he? He didn't go, hey, my lost axe head's over here. Could you float it, dude? Maybe just like put it in my hand. Would that be good? He didn't do that. He just let him know, hey, here's what the problem is, and it wasn't even mine, right? That's what we're supposed to do with God. But how often is it we go, hey, God, you know what? I need this cancer gone. Cancer's got to be gone, God. Or you're not God. Right? God, I have this financial problem, and I have to have a 1000 bucks, and if I don't have it, that means you don't care, you don't love me, you're not God. And when we don't believe and we don't trust and we don't cast our anxieties upon him, that's what we're saying, even if we don't use the words. He knows our heart. He knows our heart. We continue to, to we, we have problems and we continue to cast them on God and then we continue to tell him how to do it. And the worst part is, is most of the time, those problems that we have, we created We created. I got drunk and drove, had the accident. I need a new car. And uh, if you could take care of all the court stuff, and if you could take care of the injuries, you know, you could do that, then I'll trust your God. Who was it that got drunk before they drove? Who was it, thank God, nobody died? We do it, and then we go, well, you got to fix it, Right? Here's what I want you to understand. God can fix and find everything that we've broke or lost. God can fix or find everything that we've broke or lost. Do we believe it? That's the real question. Do we believe it? Do we trust it? 2 Kings 6.6. 6. The man of God asked, where did it fall? Elisha, being the man of God, um, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made, it, made the iron float. Elisha asked him, oh, he's, he's, where's, where, where's the axe head at? Where's, where did it fall? Where was it in the water, right? He asked him where it was lost. He's, he's, uh, um, what he's doing is not just asking him, where, where's that axe head at, so I know where to throw the stick, because look, he's, he's God's man, right? Um, he could have threw the stick anywhere and made the head float. He didn't have to know where it was at. But what he does is includes the student in the process. He brings him into the process. He says, where is it at? All right. Now it floats. Right? He includes the student in the process. See, one thing that we don't, we don't, um, more often than not, far more often than not, 
we don't want to be a part of the solution. We want God just to fix everything. He's the miracle worker, right? So like uh, he's a miracle maker, so he can just make a miracle and I don't need to be involved. Just, just give me what I want, whatever that is. But here's the thing. God expects us to pray and do. God expects us to pray and do. Here's the thing. Elisha could have took, he could have said, what, where, you lost the accent? Okay, well, here it is. And just he could have called on God, and God could have right into, right into the student's hand. Hey, Elisha, I lost my ax head over. Oh, there it is. He could have done that, right? He could, have, he, could have, he could have raised it up, laid it at his feet. He could have done that, but he doesn't. What's he do? He raises it so that it floats on the water. So it floats on the water. In verse 7, it says, Elisha's talking, says, lift it out, he said. The man reached out his hand and took it. He involved the student in the process of, uh, uh, of replenishing the lost item, right, in the recovery of it, and God does that with us. So often we're like, man, I, need, I don't know, you know, I, I, we pray, right? I need this, I need that, right? It's, it's kind of like, it reminds me of the, the lady who, who um, wh- prayed for her vision to be healed so she wouldn't need glasses, right? So she quits wearing glasses. She quit wearing glasses. She starts praying, which I kind of think might have been like an answer to a prayer maybe, you know. <laughs> he might have created the glasses thing and gave them to her. That did correct your vision. Then she starts praying for the headaches to go away that she's getting because she's not wearing her glasses. And far too often we do that. Lord, I need the extra $1,000, but I'm not going to go find a job. I'm not going to cut back on how much I spend. I'm not going to. We want God just to produce the miracle, and then we'll tell everyone about it and how we didn't do anything for it. How we didn't do anything except for pray. I, I, I'm a firm believer in if, if God wants you to have a job, if you want a job and you're praying to God about it and he wants you to have that job, it's not that he won't get you the job, but you know what? He still expects you to fill out the, the application, the resume, do the interview, and not go to the interview going, yeah, whatever, yeah, God's got it for me. Go and actually interview and do put your best foot forward. God wants you to do your part too, right? But far too often we sit back, Christians sit back all the time, and just sit back, well, God, I was praying for it, and just, when's it going to happen? Right? We, Lord, there's this flood. Could you stop the water coming in my house? Well, no, I don't want to fill the sandbags and put them around the house. Right? God expects us to pray, and he expects us to do. We need to do both. We need to be prepared to do whatever he asks us to do. So Elisha asks, he says, where is it at, right? But he didn't do He didn't do all the work. He made it float, and then he had the student go out and grab it. Here's the thing. What in your life right now? You're praying to God. You're saying, Lord, I need... Lord, this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the pain, this is the struggle, this is the challenge, this is the thing. What is it in your life that God's got it hanging out there? He's just saying, grab it. Just grab it. Do something. We sit around and we complain. I don't have, I can't do. And we tell ourselves we can't do and won't do this, that, the other thing. And then we pray about it. And then we're like, I don't know what ain't happening but we won't get off our duff and go do what we're supposed to do. God's got it right there. The axe head is floating. He's just asking us, reach down and grab it. That's all he wants, reach down and grab it. I'm I'm on the journey of losing weight. Man, this has been a long journey. Seems like I've been to that forever, it seems. But you know the reality is? It really only started a couple months ago because I continue to not continue. I continue to pray about it. Well, I'm going to eat better, and I would say it, and I'd do it for a meal or two or a week or two. I'll lose 10 pounds, and i put it right back on. Lose 10 pounds, put it right back on. It wasn't until I determined, guess what, Lord, I need to, I need to lose this for my health and to make this a temple versus a megachurch once again. This has to happen. 
right? Is he wants a temple, right? I don't think God likes mega churches. Some of you are like, wait a minute, I watch them all the time. But there's so many things that don't happen in a mega church. But anyway, so this is a temple. He wants that personal relationship. How much of a personal relationship do you have with Craig Groeschel? You don't. Robert Morris, you don't. Rick Warren, you don't, right? Why? I don't care if you watch them every week. There's no personal relationship. God wants us to be a temple so he and I can have a personal relationship. So once Sheldon got serious and said, guess what, Lord, I'm going to pick up that floating axe head. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to continue on. He's answering my prayers, but I have to do mine. I have to do my part. I've got to put the fork down once in a while. I've got to stay my hands out of the cookie jar. I've got to not have all the junk in the cupboard that's so easily edible. Sheldon has to have some resistance. Sheldon has to try, has to put in the effort. I have to exercise some. And I'm not worried about beach buff body Bob, right? I could care less about that. I want to be healthy, though. And God says, I want you healthy, too, but you got to do yours. What are you doing? What are you asking for? What are you praying for? What are you saying, man, this is urgent. i got to have. I need. This has to happen. And yet you're saying, but I'm not doing anything for it. I'm not going to reach down and pick up the axe head. What axe head are you leaving laying on the ground that God said, please just pick it up? I'm answering your prayer. Will you just pick it up? Do you trust me or not? Is your faith in me or you just want to be mad at someone all the time? Do you just want to use it as an excuse? God's not answering my prayer. I'm answering it's right there. Would you please just pick it up? He wants us to pick up that floating axe head. And we need to pick it up because there's some words that we don't like to say when we say them. Words that really hurt like, I wish I would have. I wish I would have told her how much I loved her before she died. And now I can't. I, if only I had forgiven him before he died. Now I can't forgive him. I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I wouldn't have had the affair. I wish I wouldn't have had the drinking addiction. I wish I wouldn't have had the gambling addiction. I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I, I wish I wouldn't have walked away from my family. I wish I wouldn't have walked away from God. I wish I wouldn't have. Those are words they hurt so much. My prayer is that we'll pick up the floating axe head now so it doesn't get to that day when they're gone and we no longer can, or you're gone, and you no longer can pick up that axe head of a relationship with Jesus Christ and him being the Lord of your life. So you're not gone, and that axe head of salvation isn't still floating in the water. It's there. It's there for each and every one of us. One thing we got to do in order to get to where we need to be, in order to get that relationship, grow the way we're supposed to, have that relationship with God, is we got to, there, there's things that we need to let go of, like past sins. We need to let go of past sins, right? How many times you get into that disagreement with your loved one, your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your whatever, you get into that disagreement with them, and what comes up is, but you remember when? But you always, well, you never, and they f we, we failed in some way. Maybe you're the one who said it. Maybe you had it said to you. But you failed in some way. Something you messed up. And someone holds on to that past sin, that past, past transgression. And oftentimes, we hold on to our own. I can't have a healthy relationship because of what I did in my past. I can't have a... I didn't think God had ever used me in ministry. I was in the midst of, midst of alcoholism. I was in the midst of raging anger. I was in the midst of an idiot. That idiot being me. But God said, guess what? I'm still going to use you if you're willing and finally, I picked up the axe head. I took it out of the water, and he healed, and he's using. 
And he wants to do that with each and every one of us. He wants to use us. Micah 7, 18 and 19 says, Where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Hello, we got a floating axe head in the water. God raised it up. Hello, he wanted that floating axe head picked up. But those sins of yours and mine that he threw to the depths of the ocean, he wants us to let them go. They're transgressions from before. Did you repent of them or not? Did you, get, did you turn from your sinful ways or not? If you did, quit going fishing. Why do you want to throw the grapple hook out there and drag up them old sins? God forgave you. Forgive yourself. Please forgive yourself. God already has, and he's like, dude, just pick the, hammer, the axe head. Just pick it up. I got it floating. You don't see a floating axe head very often, dude. Pick it up, right? He's got those miracles laying there for us. He wants us to pick up the axe head that he's got for us. Are we willing to do it? That peace that you're struggling with that you can't find, it's there. It's floating. He's saying, will you pick it up? That healed relationship, that healed relationship is floating. He's just saying, will you pick it up? That addiction, it's, it's, it's floating. And he's saying, will you pick it up? I've got it. It's, it's floating. Just pick up the healing. Just pick up the repentance. Pick up the salvation. Pick up the redemption. Pick up the forgiveness. Pick up the love that I have for you. Just pick it up. It's there for you. Theodore Roosevelt once said, do what you can with what you have where you are. Do what you can with what you have where you are. Only thing missing out of that is, and then let God do the rest. Man, that would have been a perfect quote. That would have been a great meme, right? You could put that on Facebook right there, right? Just saying. That's what we need to do, though. We do, do what we can, where we're at, with what we have, and then trust God. Believe that he answers prayers. Believe he can float an axe head. Have faith. Have faith. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. How, which situation? Just that one? Okay, I just want to make sure we were all everything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, are we usually thankful before something's happened, before the response has come, before the answer's there? Usually we're anxious. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Right? We're to be thankful when we come to prayer and petition. Because we're supposed to be trusting, if we believe God is who God is, we should be believing our prayers are answered. So we should come with thanksgiving for answered prayer. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. They say it transcends everyone except for the super geniuses. Nah. Hey, no one here can even come close. No one on this, in this world, on this earth, that can even come close to the understanding that God's got. He, th there's nobody. I don't care how smart your friend is or how smart you think you are. Your thinking don't even come close to God's thinking. Your understanding don't come close to God's understanding. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want us to personalize this. Let's take that verse, that scripture. Let's take that promise that he's got for us. Let's take that. Let's personalize that today. Let's claim it. Let's pick up the axe head. Let's pick it up today and claim it. Verse. Repeat with me. I will not be anxious for anything. I will not be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition... With thanksgiving, 
I'll present my request to God, not to my neighbor, not to my spouse, not my parent or my kid, not my coworker, but to God. I'll present my request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father God.